Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. So welcome back to the second stream for the day. Listen, we got a lot of things to go over, so let's just jump right in. There was a, um, an interview with uh, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, BlackRock being one of the largest asset managers on the planet, with almost 10 trillion assets under management. And he said this on live TV. And just to give you some context about where we're going here, when I'm talking about, and of course, the thumbnail and the title and all that stuff, this was from July 14, 2023. Now, I can't tell you all the things that Larry has said positively about uh, Bitcoin, but in this one, I mean, we know that he said that, that gold is a digital asset, that tokenized, tokenization of real-world assets is going to be the next big thing. And this one, he talks about how crypto, Bitcoin, whatever you want to say, will transcend any one currency. Now, I know there's a lot of people out here that will say, hey, Bitcoin isn't, isn't crypto. Get it straight. But in here, it leaves things open to interpretation. So he says, and this is an interview, before we get to the live one, he says, we believe we have a responsibility to democratize investing. Over the last five years, more and more global investors are asking us about the role of crypto. I think this is very funny. He says here, over the last five years, more and more global investors are asking us about the role of crypto. I find that funny because just two or three years ago, he was saying, we've asked all our investors and zero people have any type of inkling to get into Bitcoin and digital assets but now all of a sudden it's five years. I'm gonna let that one go. And like I said, I do think a lot of crypto is an international asset. More importantly, because it's so international, it's going to transcend any one currency in currency valuation. International crypto products can transcend the problem of a dollar devaluation. And again, crypto is an international asset. Asset, a very hard asset. So this was an interview he did, this was uh, today. Uh, two hours ago on CNBC television, and he's here with uh, Jim Cramer. I try to cut him out as much as possible, but uh, it's about nine minutes long. I linked in the description, you listen to the whole thing. It's interesting, but here's the crux of it. At the very end, what he's going to talk about is what I feel the best investors do, which is they're hopeful and they stick around for the long haul and they don't look at a day to day operation. I mean, unless you're a scalp trader, I suppose. But the hardcore or the, or, or the investor that looks for the long term is usually the one that usually works itself out pretty well over the long haul. And what he's going to talk about here as far as is hard assets, hard assets. And what, what, is, what did he talk about before as far as assets? Crypto, Bitcoin, digital assets. So I'm going to have you take a listen to this. This is a very short clip. It's only about a minute long. And uh, then we'll go over some other things about uh, the SEC and Grayscale and the appeal process and all that great stuff that's going on right now. So just take a listen, make sure you can hear this, and off we go. I think the traditional reallocation, I think the 60-40 type of thing, I think, it, it, you know, for a long-term investor, long-term view, who can tolerate market volatility, you should be at least 80% in equities or, or, or hard assets. Amen. It could be real estate, it could be infrastructure. And if you could really tolerate it, in my mind, you should have been 90%, 100% in equities. Now, the, a lot of but people, people can't afford that type this of volatility. This is a radical view, and yet it's, it's always, an empirical view. It, it, it proves out. You've got to have a 10, 20-year view. Right. Okay, I'm a hopeful person. I believe that in 10 years and 20 years, humanity is in better position than it is today. With that view, I want to own hard assets. I want to own equities. I want to be a part of this economy. I mean, that's it. That's the whole thing. And he's telling you, which I think was very, was, it was pretty interesting where he says, you know, you want to be into 80 to 90% of, of equities and assets, which I think is, is one of those thought processes that right now is not going over very well. I think a lot of people are looking at bonds. They're looking at T-bills, they're looking at treasuries, and they're going, you know what? I think this is the better option. Here's Larry Fink, who's, you know, so far been doing, I guess, okay in his investments. And he's sitting here telling you, like, you can do that, but over the long haul, I think these are the things that get into assets 80 to 90%. So I can get behind that. I thought it was a little crazy what he said there uh, for that last piece, 80 to 90% of equities. Like, even I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get 90% into crypto. I'm just not going to do that. I have a lot of it into crypto, but I still believe in diversification. I don't know if this, we're going to have a recession or whatnot come up, but I diversify a little bit. Crypto, a little bit of equities, precious metals, real estate, land, business. And I think with that, and I follow my rules, I think things work out. 
Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then also today, this is the final day for the SEC to appeal the Grayscale decision. This is from Eleanor, Eleanor Terrett. She is a Fox Business journalist. She says, yes, the SEC has until, I didn't know this, I thought it was just until COB. But the SEC has until midnight tonight to appeal the Grayscale decision. Now I'm gonna guess that this is in the New York federal court. I, I believe it is. Uh, that means that uh, that is 3 p.m. over there right now. So they're, if they're gonna do this, they're cutting it down the wire. If they don't, <clears throat> then in seven days from now, the case will be closed and Grayscale can start working with the SEC staff to get the process of approval rolling. Note, Grayscale would work with two SEC departments on this, corporate finance and trading markets. So now some people have said, hey, at midnight, if they don't appeal it, looks like we get that spot ETF, Rob. No, that's not how it works. All that says is that they're gonna get the option to move their Grayscale trust into a spot ETF. And that's pretty much it. And of course, the SEC could still disapprove them. Now, I think that at some point we will get a spot ETF approved. I don't know when that is. I don't think it's going to be in March, but that's just me. I'm like the only person on the planet that thinks that. But uh, I hope I'm wrong because I'd rather be wrong and rich than right and poor. So let's hope that also goes through. And then on top of that, I just wanted to speak real quick about uh, Web3. Now on this channel, we've been talking a lot about Web3 and gaming. I watched uh, Crypto Stash's... <laughs> Shay, I, I've never seen a guy so happy to stream and play games. This guy really, he's, he found the perfect niche for him. And I, on this channel, we've been talking about how Web3 Gaming is going to do very well. And we think that really comes down to that the games before sucked. And you just got to make games that actually look good and people want to play. And there's this game that's been coming out forever called Big Time. AAA ranked game. I know some, some hardcore gamers will say, no, it's not. But I mean, look, I think it looks pretty damn good. And it takes years to do this. And right now they're about to roll it out at the right place at the right time. This is a, they're in beta. It looks like there's going to be rolling things out. And I'm guessing in 2024, we're gonna see a lot more of these games that have been in production for two, three years. And you can see right here, it looks pretty good. I'm not gonna delve into it. You can watch the video I linked in the description and uh, the things that Stash goes through and plays and da 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 da. That's not the big thing. The big thing was this. Games have real world utility. It's not linked to any kind of four year cycle. It's not linked to a having. It's linked to the game and how good it is. And I thought, I still believe it's gonna be very big. And on top of that, uh, the, big, the big time gaming token just got released on two big platforms, OKX and Coinbase. And you know how it went? It went pretty damn good. So what's the day? The 13th? This was uh, yesterday, day and a half ago, I don't know. So we started out at uh, five cents a nickel, and then we topped out at uh, 31 cents, not bad. I'm gonna do some quick math. That's like a six X in a day. And then of course now we are, we're you know, down to 24 cents. But again, I thought these things would do very well. Could this crash tomorrow? Yes, it could. Will it be pretty big in the future? I believe so. Am I 100% sure? No, because I don't have a crystal ball. But again, look towards those games that people actually wanna play and are playing, and the Web3 is just cherry on the top of the cake, I guess. So these are the things that are going on. And then uh, also as a reminder, uh, tomorrow I'll be drawing the 100,000 uh, sweat coins, which I also think is gonna be very good. And uh, I'll be drawing that live on the uh, stream. Just know that there is a tweet that you have to enter if you wanna win. It's gonna be 5,000 uh, sweat coin per, per, per individual. That'll be, that means there's 20 winners. Plus we're drawing the NFTs. All you gotta do is go to the tweet, follow news assets, sweat economy, comment below, fill out this form. I'll draw it tomorrow. And then uh, as a reminder, I will be having uh, Orderly, which is who sweat coin uh, teamed up with, with their app. So that you're gonna be able to not only earn sweat coins, but you're gonna be able to trade those sweat coins for things like near and USDC. And looks like a fiat on and off ramp. I'll let you know when that actually comes in. So, uh, again, tonight is the deadline to enter for this. That's why I'm talking about it right now. So if you want to try to win, there's like 30 winners for that between the sweat coins and the actual NFTs. Anyhow, good luck. Draw tomorrow. And then also, you know, we've got DeFi and now we've got Gamify and whatever Fi's are out there. What about Analytic Fi? This is a, a piece I came across about Coinbase Ventures. 
and the Base Ecosystem Fund. I found this pretty interesting because I like this project. Base Ecosystem Fund announces the first six investments. Base, if you don't know, is the layer two solution that is, was developed by Coinbase. You can't buy it. It's not a token that you can actually get, but it's built on optimism. And uh, it's had quite a lot of traction with different companies coming in. What I found about crazy about this is this article. This was five days ago. I missed it somehow. The Base Ecosystem Fund, led by Coinbase Ventures, aims to invest in the next generation of on-chain projects building on Base, which a lot of people will seem to want to do. We've received over 800 applicants, applications for our Base Ecosystem Fund, and we picked six. Six out of 800. Avantis, BSX, Onboard, Open Cover, Paragraph, and Trueflation. I find this interesting because I use Trueflation all the time. We've talked about this, this uh, website for quite a bit of uh, days, especially leading up to different CPI numbers and, of course, uh, the FOMC meetings and things like that, where it takes a look and it aggregates all the information to get you real-world, real-time data as far as what the actual inflation rate is based on the Chainlink Oracle, pulling in data from a lot of different partners like J.D. Power, Zillow, Truly, Card, AAA, all this stuff. And it's free. <laughs> Everybody likes free. So what I did was I reached out to Stefan Rust. I said, hey, man, uh, this will, you know, I know we've been on, on the show before, but I want to talk about all this new upgrades that you've been doing and what the heck is all this going on and what's happening. So he said, sure. So he came on. We did a pre-recorded uh, interview. This is about 10 or 12 minutes or so. So just take a listen. I got to tell you, I think if you're looking at uh, something to actually, I'm going to let you listen to the video. That's, that's the best thing. And then we go from there. And then bef after we get done with the uh, interview, uh, I'd like to talk to you about <laughs> how Terra Luna is targeting Citadel Securities, alleging a connection to the DPEG of their UST. Who's Citadel Securities? It's the largest market maker in the world in more than 50 countries. Largest designated market maker on the New York Stock Exchange. If this is true, this is huge. We'll get to that in a second. Let's take a listen to the interview with uh, me and Stephen, Stefan. I always say his name wrong. And we'll go from there. Take a listen. So Stefan Rust, again, coming back on the show. I want to say this is, I think, our third or fourth visit. I can't remember, but welcome back to the show, man. Yeah, thank you for having me. I think this is going to be our fourth one this time. So it's like great. Look, always exciting to be back with you, Rob. Thanks for having me. Yes, and for some reason, we like everybody likes to have you back because for some reason, this thing called inflation just kind of sticks around, pun intended. So what I want to talk to you about today was there's uh, some advancements that you guys got on the on the website, trueflation.com, 100% free website. There's some upgrades going on, and I wanted you to walk us through that. Yeah, no, love to, love to. We the team's working hard, constantly adding new data points, uh, filtering through the data itself. It's really um, challenging. We've upgraded our systems as we then get into V4, which is the decentralization of the systems, and we're now running V3. I think on Monday or Tuesday we'll have completed the final transition of all that data onto v3 from a back end so this is the stuff nobody sees but without this we can't present the stuff that you see on the front end um and we'll be and so some of the changes um have have had a significant impact perfect so let's get into some of the changes i mean as far as yeah. graphically and the graphical representation of what's happening the first thing i notice when i go to trueflation is i get this yeah. u.s inflation rate aggregated which is a little bit different from when i usually come in and it takes a look at just like the basic U.S. inflation rate, which is going straight down. Right. So, again, when I'm taking a look at this, and I thought it was genius because when we take a look at the CPI numbers, inflation numbers, this is what we usually see. And again, of course, everybody, this is Ben Swem site and the Cryptoverse links in the description, 10% off the first month you care to sign up. But this part right here, this is what everybody hears about. Okay, the CPI, the, the inflation year over year. We started up here roughly 9%, a little bit over a year ago. And we keep hearing these reports about how inflation is going down and it sounds fantastic. We're like, this is good. And we go up a little bit and everybody kind of says, well, not too bad because we're only at, you know, whatever, whatever percentage we are at, 3.7%. But if I take a look at here for the aggregate, aggregated data, it looks like I'm going the exact opposite. What are we looking at here, Stefan? So what we're looking at here is we, we saw that same view and we constantly got feedback from our community that 
you know, this is not reflective. Prices aren't coming down. Prices aren't coming down. What do you mean? It's it's only 2.6% or 2.4% according to our numbers right. where inflation's at, right? And it's like, how can you say that? And it's like, actually, what we're saying is that the prices are still going up, but they're only going up 2.4% as a percentage over last year. So take the price that was there last year and mm -hmm. see how much more expensive that same item is compared to last year. And then what we've been told is actually, no, 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 you can't do that, right? So what we've then gone back and said, let's have a look at how we calculate this and how we present this. Okay. And so what we've said is we got to aggregate the pricing because in essence, not only are you paying 2% more this year over last year, last year you're paying 10% more than you paid the previous year, which you're paying 8% more. So if you add all of that up, all of a sudden, you're paying 23% more for the all your items across all your baskets, uh, your basket of consumption. Um, and that's how much more you're paying. So that's a hidden tax of 23% that people are paying or a loss in income of 23% or a reduction in purchasing power of 23%, whichever way you look at it. That's yeah. ultimately what we've come to. And if you look at the data, here we do it not only year on year anymore. We've then looked at this month over last month and then just pulled all of that together across each of the months and added that up to where we are at 23.47% now. This makes a lot of sense. I can, yeah. I can see now why the Fed is just so so adamant about getting us down to this 2% this level because, I mean, it's going to go up. And if you think about like 2%, well, it's not too bad, 3%, but it compounds over time. Yep. And we're all losing this purchasing power as time goes on. I, I, I got to tell you, when I took a look at this, I'm like, holy smokes, this is a lot of money that we're losing. And then I don't know if you want to jump all the way to this, but you guys did this personalized inflation calculator. If you could walk yep. me through this one. Yeah, so we did this personal calculator. And, and the reason why is everybody has different spending patterns. Everybody has a different income. And so what we wanted to do was how did I now personalize my expenses? I spend money different to the na average household um, mm -hmm. or the panel that, and, or the census data that Trueflation uses. So yeah. what is it for me, right? How does it impact me? And so we just wanted to show um, people how it actually impacts you personally, show you your inflation rate and how much in terms of monthly dollar numbers you are losing and what you need to do to make that make up for that and how more importantly do you hedge that today it's a very manual process you have to unfortunately put everything through in there manually and yeah. it's a bit tedious because it's a bit like a tax form uh, but we're changing that we're going to give certain profiles of people so it also automatically pre-populates it based on profiles we're also going to enable the integration with credit cards with um uh, uh, with Expensify, with Zero, if you're a small, medium business. So you can not only do it as an individual or a household, you can also do it as a small, medium business if you'd like to. Cool. And then yeah. we, talk, we talked about this before, like you can see over here, like a year ago, <clears throat> uh, roughly a year ago, October 17th, you know, for the numbers I just put in, they were just, um, you know, made up, but that's an 11% increase I was spending a year ago. Now, yeah. of course, I mean, things have gone up, but I'm, it's come down a little bit, but I yeah. think it would be cool. And like we talk about this is like a click on this and see how much I'm spending over here. It is, it, it really is eye opening how much we're, I mean, it is that silent tax. You're right. So if you're looking at, I mean, in this case, you've got an annual household income of 50,000. Yeah. You divide that by 12, you're looking at maybe what, 48,000, 45,000, 4,500, sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and what does that mean? Every month you're losing $100 in purchasing power, right? So actually you're walking away with $4,300 instead of $4,500 because you've got $112 that you've lost in inflation this month. And next month's going to be more, right? Because it just compounds. Because next month, the interest rates or inflation is going to go up. Um, and I, yeah, I, we just don't think inflation's going away. Uh, you know, just given the geopolitical situation, the issues with supply chain, the onshoring, um, that economies of scale are going to diminish 
Um, and, and as a result, supply chain, uh, you don't need, you know, you can't leverage that. You're going to need to build out infrastructure to support that. And in order yeah. to support that, you, it costs you money with interest rates at the rate they are and takes time, you know. And so all of that's going to have a significant impact on inflation. And three to five percent is the new normal, not any more two percent. You should be a bit more positive, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's the truth. I mean, this yeah. is what, what's going on. So, I mean, I get that you guys built a, fa a fantastic foundation here. And of course, yeah. it's, it's most of this uh, all free, all this data that you have for free. But at some point, you got to keep the lights on. Yeah. So what's going on here as far as like, this is new. There's pricing here. Yeah. And there's also, it looks like some kind of token. What's happening? So we are, we're going to continue to make the website for free. We're still going to give it to users for free. We want people to be able to access this information and be able to use this as an educational platform. But yeah. for individuals that want to use a more detailed calculation, they want to use this for investment decisions. Yeah. We're going to ask them to subscribe to the data. At the moment, you can download the data and you can subscribe to the data. So if you scroll down, you also get the ability to subscribe to the data. Okay. Um, we're going to incorporate the download capabilities into the subscription capabilities and provide you with the ability to download three years of data um, and, and, and be able to customize the features, integrate your credit cards, store your history so you can then see where you're at and just tweak it as you need um, or have live integrations with your Expensifier Zero and, and, and thereby have significant value. Um, we've tried to monetize this in the last three months. We've been experimenting, asking the community. And what we've heard is, is I think they want that simplification just around subscription. So that's what we'll do. Um, yeah. Um, ultimately, we've been funding this out of our own pocket and out of some investors' pockets. So that's um, how we've been able to make this available. Well, I can see that. And then, of course, you guys have an enterprise solution. I'm yep. moving forward for the, for the big companies I can get it. So, and of course, like these are the big companies that I think will want to use this data as opposed to, because these are like the most up-to-date things. Now, yep. I think with the Fed, they kind of, they maybe look a little bit backwards. I think companies, enterprise, they want to actually look a little bit more forward. So I can, I, I get on top of that, but what's this then? You got the, uh, the, the token itself. How does this work? Yeah. Yeah, so we want to fund this and, and we want to we've been building a community around this. We've been working with data sources and data aggregators as partners in helping us you know aggregate 18 million items and have three price feeds for each of the items. Yeah. Um, and so how do we reward them? How do they get rewarded for working as hard as as they do to help make this become a reality? How do we work with and decentralize the data so it becomes, number one, censorship resistant, but also it stays up and running so you can't shut it down um, and it remains permissionless so anybody can upload data. Uh, so we've been focusing really how do we decentralize the storage of this data um, and put it on the blockchain so it becomes transparent and immutable. One of the things that we're seeing is governments are going back six months, as far as six months back, to change the data that they have been publishing and announcing publicly. And of course, yeah. it's like, oh, we changed the data, but it's on page 27 in short, <laughs> you know, in small format, in the, as a footnote, we changed the data. So nobody really sees it and nobody pays attention to it anymore because it's not frontline news. Um, and so that's why we believe that putting this on the blockchain is really important. How do we fund it and how do we give everybody participation in this is through a token. And so we've been working on our tokenomics mm -hmm. uh, to make this possible. And we will be having a, a listing for Truflation in the not too distant future. Um, and we're just working through the details, what it takes and waiting for the right time as well. Um, you know, there's not much liquidity in crypto at the moment. Um, so we're just waiting for the market to pick up a little bit and see when the right time is there. Well, that, ugh, this is not the right time. You got a good point there. Hey, so real quick, like with, with the token itself, like you got pricing over here. Do you pay with that in a token or this is in dollars or can you do both? At the moment, it's in dollars. You can pay however you want. You can pay in crypto assets. You can pay in fiat assets. And you can pay in TFI. You'll get a discount if you pay in the TFI token. So that'll be discounted. 
um, and all the participants that are building this utility uh, will have uh, will be rewarded for their work and their efforts to sustain the utility with the fees that are being paid. I got. I can see why maybe your partners that you know is pulling data from you and you pulling data from them. Maybe that would be what they do moving forward. Interesting yeah. concept. Yeah, I can see that. All right. Um, well, especially as more real world assets move on chain, um, we're going to see some sort of shift between at the moment, the power dynamics are definitely in the fiat world for real world assets. All the pricings are determined over there. But as they get tokenized, pricings are slowly going to shift on chain. And then ultimately, how do you blend the two together and then come up with an accurate price reflection between those? Um, that's going to be all about calculations, weightings, the right kind of indexing tools. Um, and the right presentations of that. And we think we've got a competitive advantage and a leadership role in that um, space to be able to really help people navigate and understand the intricacies associated with it. Oh, that's, you know what, that's true. I never thought of it that way. Because, I mean, if you don't get the accurate data, you don't get the accurate numbers correct, then, of course, the people that are pulling these real-world assets, they're like, well, this is, you got one thing over here, we got one thing over here. This is some government data that we think is right, but we're not for sure. And now here's stuff that's actually on an immutable ledger. So maybe we'll just use this and we'll go yeah. with this. Okay, that makes sense. All right. And you're making billions or trillions of, dis of, of investments based on the data that you've got. Do you mm -hmm. think it's better to have fresh daily updated data, more accurate reflection, where you have insights into the methodology, you have transparency associated with that data, and you're making investment decisions based on that, or you're making investment decisions between on stale data, it's, it's six months old, it gets edited back, it changes, you don't know, it's intransparent how it's calculated, it's in some nebulous fashion, uh, calculated in some nebulous fashion, um, we just think that, you know, you don't want to make investment decisions based on the latter data. You'd hopefully make it on the former data because ultimately that gives you the better insight and it compounded has a significant better impact. Well, and you know what? It's a good point. And it's something we talked about last time you were on here because people would, yeah. would tell me they're like, I'm not going to use Trueflation because the Fed doesn't use Trueflation. So why would I care about that? Yeah. I'm like, well, that is true. But if you want to see where things are actually going so far, Trueflation has been pretty darn accurate. And then you've had uh, Danielle, the Martino yep. Booth. Yep. She's pretty much saying, hey, they've been uh, correlated up to 0 0.97, which is pretty much a positive correlation. And I can see it. If you want to know where things are going, I think it's to take a look at this site. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, we've had a number of, I mean, we've had a number of hedge funds vet us. We've got a number of Wall Street entities, um, big firms that, our, our household names, um, you know, um, especially, and then also big institutions that are household names equally so using our data. Um, and so they validated it and proved it. And what they actually prefer is not the actual data in terms of how we calculate it, but they're actually looking to have our aggregated data volumes calibrated towards that of how we believe they, um, institute the government you know is going to be announcing it oh, so shit. that gives them a lead time of maybe somewhere between three to six months ahead of where the government will be coming because we have fresh data it's up to date and it's using the similar methodology based on our assumptions and the based on what we see uh, just using fresh data that's all that's that's the only difference that's a huge leg up. Stephen, yep. you've said a lot of stuff in the last 10 minutes or so. I think I'm going to let everybody digest that and we'll have you back on when the next, uh, you know, let's have you back on when the next CPI stuff rolls out. Yeah. Then we can talk about it. Well, there's an FOMC meeting on, oh, I think I it's November this. 1. Uh, yes. There are two more FOMC meetings this year, November oh, 1 okay. and I think December 13th. So um, maybe there's, we'll have some insights around that. So um, I will reach out to you when we get close to that time and hopefully you'll have me back on. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. So everybody, you can find uh, Trueflation. There's a link in the description to the website and all the different sociables. But again, Mr. Russ, thank you so much for stopping by the show yet again. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Rob. All right. So uh, <clears throat> I hope that made sense. Uh, with Trueflation, again, it's a 100% free website. And for I'll just be honest with you guys. Uh, for 99% of us, uh, we're not going to pay $117 it is per month to do economic models and do all these things. That's just the truth. 
But uh, for big businesses and corporations and things like that, they will probably get involved. And then, of course, with the token, it's a little bit different. And I think uh, for the businesses to get in with the token and to stake that token and to use that to get real world data on there, which they also use Chainlink to pull that data as far as oracles and move it around or to, to quantify that information. I think this could be for some other. I do not believe this is for like, again, a ton of just the retail investors. I just thought it was very interesting. And of course, the website is done very well. Now, uh, the token hasn't been released. Uh, I'll get uh, uh, Stefan back on the show and we'll talk about that. But uh, to me, it would be a utility token. And that is what it would do if somebody wanted to invest in that uh, as somebody else, but mostly it would be for utility. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then lastly, before we get into the uh, Q&A, let me go over the Terra Luna, which <clears throat> was interesting story. And take this with a grain of salt. So Terraform or Terra Luna targets Citadel Securities alleging potential connection to the DPEG. Maybe this is what happened for the collapse of Terra Luna was that Citadel Securities caused the DPEG and caused everything to crash. Again, Citadel Securities, largest market makers in the world. It's in 50 different countries, largest designated market maker on the New York Stock Exchange and one of the biggest market makers, I believe, on Robinhood. So this is what we have. Terraform Labs filed for a motion to compel Citadel Securities to provide certain data responsive to a third-party subpoena, which it argues to be vital. The company serves subpoenas to both Citadel Securities and Citadel Enterprise Americas, specifically targeting trading data related to the May 2022 DPEG. Ah, good times. Terraform has pointed to publicly available evidence suggesting that the head of the Citadel entities, Ken Griffin, very common name in the uh, circles of traditional finance, intended to short UST at or above the time of the DPEG. Evidence suggesting one Citadel security may actually have had a connection to the DPEG, despite the fact that Citadel Securities publicly de denied ever having traded in UST during that event. They claim that a document, though it's unclear what type of document, was produced and they can prove these things. Now, that sounds like a pretty good story. And of course, we'd be very quick to jump on that and say, that's gotta be what it is. It's gotta be them because they're huge and they can do those things and they're the ones that we should blame. Hold on. Here's where it gets wonky. Terraform clarified that it issued subpoenas to certain market participants with two going to the aforementioned Citadel entities. The firm cited a Discord chat screenshot in the filing showing a anonymous trader who claimed to have had lunch with the CEO of Citadel, Ken Griffin. The screenshot, which is just quoted in the filing, allegedly claims that Griffin planned to Soros the F out of Luna UST. In response to the initial subpoena, Citadel told Terraform, Citadel has no trading in the Terra financial instruments or the Terra native tokens and therefore has no responsive, responsive documents. So again, take that with a train of salt, grain of salt. Uh, if it actually turned out to be true, it would be a blockbuster. And it would be uh, interesting to see that one of the biggest market makers on the planet was responsible for a crypto project to DPEG and cost a ton of people billions of dollars. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And uh, that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Now, if you want to stick around, we'll do a little q and I'll answer all your questions to the best of my abilities, and we'll go from there. All right. What do we got? Ah, S. Kazen. Kazen. 